I'm Edie Lash, and I'm the executive editor of Hub Culture. Very pleased to be here in the Hub Culture studio, where we are very proud to be partnering with Handshake. Absolutely delighted to be joined by James Lazak. How are you? I'm really well. Yeah, it's great to be here. Welcome Thank to Davos. Thank you very much. What a beautiful town. Fantastic. So CEO of Swayable. Now, before you tell us about Swayable, I want to hear what your thoughts are on the theme of the World Economic Forum down the road from us here, collaborating in a fragmented world. What does that mean to you? Yeah, I mean, the world is obviously fragmented in kind of scary ways. And I think when people are collaborating, you know, you, you have to ask to what end. And I think mm -hmm. that's where leadership plays a really important role. I think obviously Davos has a lot of folks in leadership positions. And, um, you know, we think that if you're going to lead sets of people effectively, you have to make an effective case for where you're leading them. Mm. And so I think, um, you know, persuasion, which is what we tend to focus on, is a really critical component of that. If you're not persuading people of the goals, then, you, you know, there's no collaboration to... To be had. So tell me a little bit more about that. What is the power of persuasion and what, is, what you do? How does that help leaders measure how persuasive they are? Yeah, well, we focus very um, narrowly on measuring how much impact a message has on mm -hmm. people's opinions or their attitude or their intent to do something. Mm -hmm. And I think when you think about the role of a, a leader or a brand or a, you know, a public figure, mm -hmm. um, when they're making the case for what we should do collectively as society or as consumers or voters, um, they're effectively persuading you to think about the world in a way that's consistent with those goals. And um, so I think that the power of persuasion is really about recognizing how important it is to do that right. Mm. And um, you don't know if you're doing anything right unless you can measure the impact you're having. So really our contribution to that is to do that measurement uh, as, as best as possible. We're, we're known for really establishing um, this gold standard metric, a randomized control trial metric mm -hmm. for the impact on people's opinions. How's that different from polling? Yeah, well, we, uh, we think very highly of pollsters, and pollsters mm -hmm. are really measuring what people think right now. If mm -hmm. I just ask you a question, do you agree or disagree? Are you going to vote? Are you not? Do you want to mm -hmm. buy this product or not? And that's critical. What we're measuring is how you change that. Mm -hmm. And I think it's one thing to know what people think. It's another to know if you can actually impact that. And I think both go together. Mm -hmm. um, the polling really ultimately lets you know if you've been successful after running a big campaign, mm -hmm. but you have to make a decision about what you're actually saying in that campaign. Yeah. And without the impact data, without the persuasion data, there's no way to know. So tell me about what you found out in, the, in, the, in recent years. What have you found about, about how you change people's minds, how you make pe people take action? Yeah, well, there's been a big set of pendulum swings, I think, away from um, a couple of concepts that people thought were going to be very helpful. Mm -hmm. I think we heard a lot a few years ago about micro-targeting, you know, getting mm -hmm. down to the individual level to figure out how to get in your head and, you know, manipulate you in some way, <laughs> right? You know, creep up on your Facebook activity and, yeah. you know, hyper-target you. And I think one thing we've learned is that that's been really overblown. Thank that, goodness for that. Yeah, we don't need to creep up on your information. Right. We can ask you opt-in questions. Mm -hmm. and because we're doing public communications, unless there's a lot of people that have something in common with the way you think about the world, right. then there is no way to craft a good message. You know, mm -hmm. these are billboards or TV campaigns or digital campaigns that reach thousands, millions of people. Um, so the kind of creepy micro-targeting stuff, I think, you know, mm -hmm. thankfully, um, yeah. really isn't necessary and actually isn't effective. Interesting. So we've swept that one away. You've worked on some interesting uh, campaigns uh, for brands, for also for for um, for people as well. So tell me about some of those. Yeah. Well, look, we do a lot of work um, both with big public-facing consumer brands globally. Um, some of the biggest ones uh, around, um, you know, Hollywood studios, big retailers, um, you know, large technology companies. We also work with a lot of public um, officials, uh, mm -hmm. political leaders in the United States. We worked uh, very proud to work with the Biden Harris. Mm -hmm. uh, winning presidential campaign, and, and also some of their um, primary competitors in, in my home country where I grew up in Australia. We actually worked with three of the, um, the sort of groupings of political mm -hmm. um, candidates there. So, um, look, it's been an incredible ride. I think, you know, seeing folks who take seriously the need to persuade and to make the case for their vision for society mm. and seeing how that really works when you focus on the kind of the, the leadership of that, the, the actual persuasive content of your, of your messaging instead of kind of, you know, the that the poll driven kind of blowing with the wind approach that I right. think has, has had some currency in recent decades, but I think we're starting to see people recognize that um, they need to make their case. So you've worked with, with Paramount, for example, yeah, we do work with Paramount. And, you, uh, and you try to get people to get come, or they want to get people to come into the theaters to watch some of the big yeah. movies, right? So what have they done that's effective? 
Yeah, look, Paramount's had a fantastic year. In fact, I think it's the biggest, highest grossing ever year, which is just extraordinary given that, you know, we're not quite out of the global pandemic mm. yet. And their whole business is based around getting people into a theatre, you know, to, to, mm. to pay the box office, uh, you know, ticket price and, and see these films. And they had, uh, you know, um, Top Gun Maverick was, I think, the highest grossing mm -hmm. film. So I think they've really embraced this story that you have to make the measurements mm -hmm. up front, that ultimately these are complicated stories and, you know, community dialogues around what to see and, you mm -hmm. know, whether to go out to vote and what to buy in the supermarket. And um, so by doing really routine, rapid, um, systematized testing on Swable, which they mm -hmm. now do for... Um, all of their major releases, um, you know, they really embraced that and saw that, um, you know, there were particular clips from these films that were really, you know, getting people hmm. doing the, the, the blood racing, you know, those, right. those are incredible pieces of, um, you know, art. And uh, that obviously is the, you know, primary reason they were successful. We don't yeah. really take credit for their incredible year. But, you know, we were certainly part of it. And the team there has been really wonderful to work with. Yeah. Fantastic. And you mentioned Biden-Harris as well. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about, about anything that surprised you, for example, during that campaign. Yeah, look, it was an incredible campaign. I mean, um, there were so many surprising things. And obviously, you know, the, 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 the president was, you know, was ultimately, you know, successful, mm. which we were, we were, you know, very, very proud to be, be part of. I, I think, you know, there were a lot of really hot debates around, um, you know, hot topics, especially mm. in the primary elections. And it was very interesting to, to see how, um, you know, I think there were, were quite big differences in telling the same story in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, that if you told, for example, stories about healthcare policy, mm -hmm. using particular anecdotes and particular kind of complaints that people have about affordability and ac accessibility, you know, the, 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 the same policy can be more influential in terms of the persuasive impact of a story told one way than another way. There can be often be very dramatic differences. So, Interesting. You know, Is there anything in particular that you noticed about that? Like one story yeah, versus another one? You know, there were a lot of, um, uh, there were a lot of these town hall um, mm -hmm. uh, debates. And I think in the debates often or, or you know, um, meetings, you know, people would come up and tell their own stories. And, you know, you'd often see folks who'd have real issues with the healthcare system. You know, you'd have uh, a woman who, you know, struggled to um, afford, you know, care for her, mm -hmm. her, her kid. And then you'd have an, another person on the side that had almost a very similar story. Um, and I remember noticing, at least in one of these cases, that, um, you know, the, the, the fundamental story was basically the same policy, mm. but vastly more persuasive impact with a particular story about a child, you know, mm. um, than just some other particular story. And there were kind of subtle nuances, I think, in how compelling the particular kind of interlocutor was in those debates. And, right. you know, stuff that you just wouldn't pick up in advance and you wouldn't know without getting the data. Interesting. Yeah. So I wonder what strong policy ideas how they come across in an election. You know, strong policy ideas are often very divisive. Things like abortion, things like gun control. Right. And I imagine, or I, I hypothesize, that, uh, that sometimes we might want to see policy leaders shy away from those. But what does your data and research tell you? Yeah, we've been really excited. We've, we've done a really large meta study where we looked at basically every ad that was tested on Swayable um, in the political context through the last two or three cycles. Um, and there are people who will say, look, you know, you're trying to reach people in the middle. Don't talk about things that are too divisive. They might not agree. You mm. know, talk about mom and pop, kitchen table, apple pie, you know, sort of chicken in every pot kind of right. um, uh, stories. And look, it's not to say that those don't work sometimes. But we wanted to look really carefully and see, okay, let's look at these divisive, so-called divisive issues. You know, mm. let's look at women's reproductive rights. You know, these are fundamental rights. You know, let's look at um, the treatment of black Americans by, you know, police. These are these are issues that matter, you know, and I think, you know, political leadership and public leadership in general is sort of, you know, having, having the guts to kind of take on an issue that, that matters. But there are these voices that will say sometimes, well, you know, save it to later. Just talk about the uncontroversial yeah. stuff now and let's get to that afterwards. And uh, we were able to see really decisively that um, you could win and, um, you know, persuade moderate voters as effectively with many of these um, focuses on uh, the, these stories about so-called divisive issues than mm. the stuff that is sort of, you know, uncontroversial. And I, I think if only people had known that earlier, I think maybe we might have talked a little more about, um, you know, hmm. abortion rights, for example, in the United States. And, you know, perhaps we might have kept that dialogue going um, in order to kind of preserve some of the rights that I think, yeah. have, you know, regrettably to many people, millions of people have been lost. Interesting. So given that study, what would you recommend in terms of a communication tip for leaders or yeah. for, for brands uh, who are looking to make change? Yeah, I think using the data intelligently, um, running real experiments uh, of, the, of the kind that we do, but you know, there's, there's different ways to, to, to do it, um, and, and not being kind of poll driven, not sort of thinking that simply surveying people 
um, in the absence of your story mm -hmm. is enough. You know, you can ask people what they think, but you're there to tell a story. So the question is not necessarily just what they think, but it's how they're going to react to what you've got to say. And if you think, you know, reproductive rights are important, if you think that going to see Top Gun Maverick is important, if you think, you know, buying, you know, Thomas's uh, English muffins is important. Mm -hmm. um, and, I you love know, Thomas's English muffins. Yeah, excellent. That's not, muffins. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, I endorse them. I'm, I'm uh, you know, a little uh, more, more compromised since they're a cherished customer. Right. Um, but, um, you know, then you, you've, you've got to look at how that story moves people. You can't mm. just look at what they think without the story. Interesting. Thank you very much, James, for stopping Thanks, inside Dave. the Hub Culture Handshake Studio. Great to be here. Davos 2023. Thank you.